Hi, everyone, and welcome to our second day of the 2021 Agricultural Faculty Academy webinar series and the Soil Salinity and Old Problem with Modern Solutions webinar. We would like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor, Rainbird, for helping make this event possible. A quick minute for some housekeeping notes. I have muted everyone by default, so we won't be disrupted by latecomers. Please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation as this will help minimize any background noise. During the presentation, if you have questions, you can ask verbally or via the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation. So if you do put your questions in there, they will be voiced to our speaker. Without further ado, I would like to welcome AJ Brown with the Irrigation Innovation Consortium. Take it away, AJ. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate it. Give me one second here, I'll get us all started. All right, are we seeing my PowerPoint, Nicole? We are. Excellent. So like Nicole said, my name is AJ Brown, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about soil salinity, an old problem with some modern solutions. And so before we jump on into the topic, I thought I'd give a little background about myself. Um, like Nicole said, I'm working with the Irrigation Innovation Consortium, and I'm the assistant director based out of Fort Collins here. I work with uh, the Colorado State University, but also a large part of my job is helping business develop and run a research farm for the IIC. Um, simultaneously, I'm also a PhD candidate at Colorado State University. I study soil salinity, obviously, but also irrigation technology and irrigation scheduling. Um, and so I grew up on a small farm that gave me some background into this topic and made me really interested because Rocky Ford, Colorado, where I grew up, happens to be heavily affected by salinity. And we'll learn about why during the presentation. But um, Today, I get the pleasure of speaking with all of you about the topic, and um, anytime you want questions, um, feel free to put it in the chat, or, or, um, and then Nicole will get it up to me. So first off, um, the, the layout of, of our presentation today is going to be something about, well, first off, who cares about salt? Second off, where does it come from? Number three, how do we measure it? And then we're going to jump into what does it do in, to the soil and to the crops? And then finally, what are some ways that we can mitigate it and manage it? So who cares about salt? Uh, salt is a global problem that I think a lot of people underestimate, it seems, because, you know, the number one threat to food security in the world is erosion, right? You know, as the Dust Bowl happened in the United States in the 20s, we realized erosion was a major problem and we started having big government efforts to mitigate that. But something that's not often is advertised is the number two food security threat, which is salinity. And salinity is um, <clears throat> really worldwide and it's an issue and it's been an issue for, for centuries and millennia in some cases. Um, if you look at this map, I really love showing that just to really give people the extent of what kind of issues salt cause around the world. Every place that has a color on this map that isn't gray is, is hindered by salt. And by when I say hindered, I mean plants can't grow there as well as they normally would. And this is causing a significant amount of, of damage to crops and yields annually. And it's about worth $27 billion that could be mitigated if we are saved, if we better manage our salts. And, and even more importantly to me is not necessarily to $27 billion, but the 3.7 million acres that become unusable every year. So if we don't get our, our act together and start managing salt, especially as things like deficit irrigation and these limited um, water resources limit our ability to manage irrigation um, with full amounts of water, we have to be very careful with our salinity problems because salts accumulate when there's not enough water. And that's kind of the next topic. Why do we have a salt problem? Well, salt come from a lot of different places. We have geology, obviously, that's kind of the main one everyone thinks. When you weather materials from erosion, um, some of those materials are salts. You know, these minerals are made of things that, that can cause these salt problems. So when those get eroded, salts get deposited. Um, secondly, the climate. So you'll notice that salt problems tend to occur in arid places, really dry areas like the Western United States. And that's because wherever evaporation and transpiration exceeds um, precipitation and irrigation, you're gonna have some salts behind. And then let's see, reuse. So this is becoming more popular. When, when water gets reused 
um, each time you reuse it, and depending on what your application is, you're you're adding salt to the the system unless you're purifying it in between or something. So um, you're you're making your water more salty every time you reuse it. And this is the case for um, a really traditional irrigation style where you divert water from a river, for example, bring it to a farm, irrigate, and then let runoff go back to the river. Um, that's reuse. So you know, for example, in the I live in you know I'm in Colorado here. I grew up in a the Rocky the town of Rocky Ford, which is in the Arkansas River Basin, which runs from Colorado all the way to the Mississippi. Um, you know that water gets reused by hundreds of farms from the Rocky Mountain down to the Mississippi. So you can imagine the amount of salts that accumulate along the way. And then finally, there's some smaller contributions, but worth mentioning here: human activity. Road de-icing, that's just salt that melts the ice, right? Um, oil and gas activity and urban runoff, also very salty processes, but usually human activity is highly localized and um, relatively less impactful than some of these other big ones. And then water table. If the water table is shallow, the salts really um, have nowhere to go, and we'll see that visually here soon. But what I put here is salinity, salinity accumulation 101. It takes you all the way back to elementary chemistry class, if you have salt in water and you evaporate the water on the stove or something, the salts are going to be left in that pan. And so the only way to get salts under control is to make sure those salts are dissolved in water and then you move that water away from the things you care about. Because just like we can't drink salt water like the ocean, plants can't drink it either. And so every time we accumulate salt in our soil, and you water it and you're not getting rid of the salt and pushing it out the bottom of the root zone, what's happening is you're actually just having your plants bathe in ocean water and they can't drink it either. So the key to salinity is about drainage. We want to put water on it that's good quality and make sure we put enough on it that we can push the salts that are dissolved out of the way of the crops so that they can grow really nice. And visually, this makes, this makes it a little more easy to understand, I think. So, Let's say we have this, this sprinkler, a center pivot, and inside that water, we're getting it from a well, which in, in a lot of cases tend to be more salty. Um, and you're applying some salts that are dissolved in that sprinkler. So the salts get deposited into the ground, and then you have these plants that use some of this water and they transpire it. Well, when that happens, you're, you're concentrating the salts and it's also evaporating, which is further concentrating the salts and the salts remain in the soil. And in this case, I put a high water table as well, which also has salts because every water has salts unless it's pure water from a lab, right? Um, and so if you don't have this, a nice pathway for these salts to go to, they're gonna stay right here around these roots and it's gonna become a problem. Every time you irrigate, these are gonna dissolve, but guess what? It's ocean water, they can't drink it. It's gonna cause problems every time. So the key is to make sure that that water has some place to go and that those salts have some place to go along with it. And so how do we know if we have a salt problem? We have to measure it. And there's a few ways to do that. And the, I'm gonna throw some, some jargon at you here just to make it a little more clear about the ways that we can measure salt. So <clears throat> the two main categories are electrical conductivity. And the second one is total dissolved solids. So electrical conductivity, why is that a measure of salts? Well. You know, when you buy Gatorade and they say it's packed full of electrolytes, well, what they're really saying is that it's full of salt um, because salt makes the conductivity of water um, higher, right? So if you just shock water, it's, it's like an okay conductor, but if you put salt in that water, it's a really good conductor of electricity. So electrical conductivity is a function of how much salt is in your water, and we can do that in a few different ways. So we have what's called bulk EC. Uh, which is ECA, which is really a measure of the water and the soil and the air in the soil. We'll, we'll get more into that soon, but it's kind of a diluted EC. Pore water, if you are able to extract the pore water out of the soil exactly, so if I had a straw in there and I sucked the water out and I measured that with EC, that's ECPW. The water of the irrigation water is applied water, so ECW. Um, Saturated extract, I wanted to explain that here because this is kind of the gold standard when it comes to salinity and we, whenever we, we predict yield losses and things like that, we need to know saturated saturation extract EC or ECE. And that uh, this picture I put up here is exactly that. They, you take a soil sample, you grind it up, you add deionized pure water to it up until what we call a saturated state. 
is to make it's kind of to try to mimic the the soil around a root zone at maximum water capacity and then we suck out the water from this mud and then we measure the ec the ec of that sucked out water and that's why it's called a saturation extract there's also easier methods that are less uh, intensive because that is a very qualitative precise way um, there's gravimetric extracts, EC one to one and one to five, which just means equal weights, water and soil with the one to one, or it's one part soil to five parts water. That's what that refers to. And then total dissolved solids is, it goes back to that chemistry experiment I talked about. So if you take the water from any of these methods of obtaining it, um, if you dissolve or if you heat it up and evaporate everything and what's left over, that's how many parts were dissolved. So it's the weight of the water over the weight of the, the dissolved parts that are now dry. So total dissolved solids. And so with some of these things, I wanted to show some of the technologies that we use to measure it. So here we have some EC sensors. Uh, top left, we have this portable one that you might use in the field um, or maybe in your lab too, either way. But it it's focused on measuring water. Um, so if you have a saturated paste, a one to one or EC one to five, or if you need to take a measurement of your ECW, I should have put that one there as well. Um, these would all work. I put beneath that one directly here, you can see a little more elaborate setup with some calibrated solutions. Um, that is just a more accurate version of this field type of meter. And it does the same things. You don't wanna put that directly in soil or anything like that because it's fragile and you wanna make sure that you're reading the extract and just the water with the salts in it. However, to the right of that, we have what I, calling an in situ soil sensor, that's measuring bulk conductivity, ECA. And so you can see we have three steel rods here and those are all pulsing with electricity and that's giving us a measure of conductivity of not just water, but also soil and also the air in there as well. So th it makes a little more sense when you actually get to see the sensor itself for why it's measured and what that measurement is. And then up in the top right, we have a mass spectrometer. So this is a machine that if we had the water, we would run it through here and there's various types, but in theory, um, it's just giving us the specific amount of ions of each type. And when I say ions, I mean like how much sodium is in it, how much chloride is in it, how much calcium is in it, things like that. And so that gives us a really good idea of the salts that are in the type of solution that you put into it. But then if you sum the concentration of each ion together, once again, we have total dissolved solids because that's exactly what it is. So um, some ways to measure EC as well and out in the field um, and some current research in that area is electromagnetic adduction. So taking it back to that salts are in fact uh, electrolytes, we can have some instruments like this Varus system and this EM38 right here from, these are pictures, the EM38 is some pictures of my own PhD research where Essentially, these two instruments on the left, they're also causing electromagnetic pulses, right? They're, they're, it, you're creating a shock wave within the device, which creates an electromagnetic wave, which shoots into the ground, which creates a, a response from the ground, and then the device measures that response. And, and that's a, a measure of ECA, but it's what we call a bulk because it's averaging the whole depth of what it's reading. So this Vera system can go down to about four or five feet. This EM38 is about four feet deep. So it gives us a lot of information, but you really want to ground truth it with some manual soil samples later. But imagine taking instead of, you know, 400 soil samples in a single field, you can just take maybe six. And, and then this EM38 can calibrate to that with its readings. And then all of a sudden I have like 2,500 points in a field or something like that. So it's, it's really a powerful tool when you're making salinity maps with like this. But this one happens to be developed um, in the lower right here from a paper where they are investigating using satellites to measure root zone salinity. So as you can see here, root zone salinity. Um, the units that we use are called decisiemens per meter. No need to dive into that too much. Just know that that's a unit for electrical conductivity. Um, and this paper particularly focused on looking at satellite imagery over multiple years, right? And because Salinity is a problem that tends to be a problem year to year to year because drainage is not something that changes very quickly unless you drastically um, alter the geometry of the field or the drainage somehow. So <clears throat> this experiment, they had a satellite, they measured crop health from a satellite over a period of seven years. And if they saw a spot 
that was bad consistently over those seven years, they were kind of able to attribute that to salinity and with some ground truthing from this EM38 and the um, Vera system. So that's kind of like the cutting edge right now is we're trying to figure out how to do even larger areas of, of salinity measurement in a very cheap and effective way. So I think we think that satellite imagery might be a really powerful tool to do that. And my colleague is doing exactly that in the Rocky Ford Valley where I grew up. And he's doing the same kind of thing with this EM38, but he's integrating crop physiological characteristics to try to shorten that time instead of using seven years of data, maybe just using one or two. But um, so I can answer more questions about that at the end, but I'll, I'll move on for now. So along with how do we measure it, we kind of have some classifications and we'll go into more detail about that in the soil impact section, but salts are not just plain salts. There's, there's classifications of salts. We have saline, we have sodic, and we have saline sodic. And here's some potential symptoms. So really, I'm trying to give you some reference material and some tables so you guys can take this away and use it in your own lives. But essentially just know that saline means that it's a salty soil that isn't necessarily because of sodium chloride, which is table salt, right? So um, it means it's other types of salt like magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, really anything else, anything else other than um, sodium chloride. So sodic soil is salty because it's sodium chloride. And then saline sodic means that you have a lot of both. And that's really just the worst possible situation, really unfortunate. And so uh, we'll go into these, these symptoms in the next few slides. But once again, this is reference material for you in case you need to use this PowerPoint to help you in your applications. Um, and these criteria for justifying it, if you have a soil sample, I imagine most of you, if you ever have to do this, will have to be taking a soil sample, sending it to a lab, and all of these parameters that we use to classify, that is ECE, um, exchangeable sodium percentage, and soil pH, those will be reported by the lab and you can make that, justifi or that, um, that classification yourself. And so, like with soil, there's also a water diagnosis. And this one's a lot easier um, if you just take the TDS of a solution, so you can either just, you know, take a sample of water, dry it out yourself and, and um, try to get the TDS there. Or if you have an electrical conductivity meter, you kind of can classify water as usable or not um, based on these parameters. So water <clears throat> is pretty straightforward. And you may not know what types of salts are in the solution from these two measurements. And that is important, but it's not as important with water. It's just to know like, how much water do I need to uh, apply because how salty is it? And so once again, reference material for you, happy to answer any questions later on. Um, let's jump on right in about why we care and what, what it's doing to the soil that makes it so hard for these plants. So like I mentioned, we have a lot of different types of salts, NaCl, sodium, we have Na um, sodium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, you know, all these different things, right? We have, um, gypsum, calcite, Epsom salts, Glauber salt, all of these different types of salts. And um, it matters about what types of salt that you have in your soil because it changes the way your soil behaves um, and, the, and the types of crops that can grow there as a result of it. And so here's, here's the main reason why we care. So taking us back to chemistry again, we have in figure A up here at the top, we have calcium ions. So this, let's just say we have gypsum in this soil. So calcium and sulfate. Soils have a negative charge like clay here. And, and when you have a negative charge and you have a positive ion like calcium, and calcium actually has two positive charges, um, the soil will like to attach to the calcium and hold on to it. And in fact, another piece of soil can attach to it at the same time, causing what we call flocculation or dirt clotting, right? Calcium encourages aggregation. It, it encourages dirt clods. It encourages all of this um, joining together, which actually improves drainage, which improves your soil structure for the most part up until a point when you have so much gypsum that it's also just a problem. But for the most part, gypsum is not usually an issue and these calcium salts help the soil. However, with um, in figure B here, we have sodium, which only has a plus one charge. So when you only have one charge, once you get one piece of soil, that's it. That's all it can connect to, it's done. So it's actually separating soil and it's what we call dispersing it. So when a sodium connects to a piece of clay, that's it. The clay is happy, the sodium's happy, their charges are satisfied, and now they're just gonna disperse and be independent from one another. And so now we don't have clotting, which decreases infiltration, it decreases 
pathways. I mean, it just breaks up your soil heavily and makes it like dust, um, which is not good. And so here's what that visually looks like if we have a sodium chloride problem. So look at how black this soil is. Um, we have some dry beans growing here, but the, the soil is so black. And some of this is from, it looks a little darker because it just got freshly watered, but the soil, the, it's accumulating at the surface. Look how burnt these leaves are. I mean, this is young, so it's, it's gonna grow up and it, the whole thing's gonna be yellow and sad, but um, this is kind of what that looks like visually. And when it dries up, it's this dark powdery residue. Like I said, it feels like dust and it's just really hard to water and get rid of. Um, on the other hand, I have some samples that are full of gypsum and calcite. And this is what they look like. The aggregation's great. Look, look at all this um, clotting and we can see, actually visually see the calcium and the, the calcite clumping here that, that shows you know, the presence of gypsum and calcite. So, so, be able to look visually at the, some of that. So when you're driving down the road and you see on the side of the road, like these white patches that look like snow, oftentimes that's like calcium and it depends where you are in the United States, but that's certainly a phenomenon here in Colorado that we see a lot. And so when we have these in our soil, we need to figure out what exactly is the problem for the plants. I mean, like I said, it's like drinking salt water, um, but what does that actually mean? You know, why can't we drink salt water? Why can't plants drink salt water? So here's some of my own research results here. I have a picture of some corn that was grown in a low salt and a high salt zone. And then also a picture of the corn itself in this high salt zone that was harvested. You know, this was in July, so the corn wasn't fully mature, but you know, knee high by the 4th of July, I think not. That's a surveyor flag that's like a foot tall. So this is not a very good place to be, but great for researchers, I'll tell you what. So this is the type of corn that we retrieved from that location. So you're asking for problems and you're not, you know, you need to consider what your options are when you look at that. And we'll talk about that during the management strategies, but you know, we have symptoms of drought stress. So notice here that because this soil is a gypsum soil, it's not the sodium problem. It, um, it's not having that black residue at the surface, but it's still salty enough that we have what we, you know, it's droughts, it looks drought stress, but it's not, I promise you. There's actually a water table about two and a half foot down from the surface here, which has its own problems, but it's because the salt has nowhere to go. So the salt is just pure like ocean water in there that is not, it, it makes it so that the roots aren't able to uptake it. And this is what that means. So we measure the suction of roots using the same kind of metric that we use for pressure. So I'm putting it in terms of PSI. This was from like a, a small experiment up here in Fort Collins a while ago that, that used PSI to you know, illustrate the effects of salinity. So in order for plants to uptake water, it's all about pressure gradient. So in the roots, we have this negative 44 PSI, which is the least amount of suction. The leaves have a little more suction, which is negative 218. And then finally the air has the most suction because it's the most dry. So it has the most, um, as long as we keep this gradient, it gets less all the way out, plants will be able to uptake water and it will be able to function properly. So let's introduce some salts in the mix. So first off, we had some soil where we measured the ECE at um, one decisemen. It's at negative four PSI in the soil now. So when we test that, yes, we're all good. You know, the gradient is maintained. So if we double that, we have EC 2.0, it's negative 22 PSI. Guess what? We're still good. I mean, it's definitely um, more salty, but it's actually just fine because we're maintaining our gradient. But let's happen if we double the salinity again. If we have soil with an EC of four decisemens now, negative 46 PSI, guess what? We're not able to maintain our gradient and the roots can no longer suck up the water that they need. So that's what's happening also in our bodies when we drink soil or not, not drink soil, drinks ocean water. Our body has a suction capacity for using that water and bringing it into the parts of our body that's, that, that we need. But if we have so much salt in there, it can't actually use that water. It's an energy problem. So this is what's happening. And this is why it looks like drought stress when you see salt stress as well. And it's hard to separate sometimes too. Um, here's a table that I thought would also be a good reference of what we call sensitive, moderately sensitive, moderately tolerant and tolerant um, crops. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just know generally things like vegetable crops tend to be very sensitive. And as you go into like heavy grains and things like cotton and barley, you become very tolerant. So, and everything else falls in between somewhere. 
And here's a good reference here. The, you know, it's not hard to find this graph, but this is what that looks like. So on the Y axis, we have um, relative crop yield. So if you're at 100%, that means you're gonna get 100% yield. That's not a problem, you're good. Salt is not an issue. And it goes out to a certain threshold of salinity and you'll still get 100, but then plants will start declining at this rate. So if you're sensitive, you're gonna start declining yield about one in between one and two decisemen. And then if you're moderately sensitive, you'll start declining yield around three and so forth. So you will keep seeing this effect and that's why barley is all the way over here. It doesn't start losing yield until 10 decisemen. So these are um, a really helpful way to model and see what your yield impacts are gonna be. So if you happen to know your soil, you can go in and say, you know, I have cotton. So I only have eight, okay, I'm good to grow cotton here. Um, and so it's a handy tool. And now we go into the management strategies where the, you know, this is the real part here. So to manage salinity, there's two areas of remediation focus. We can either focus on the soil and that focuses on improving the soil structure and the quality, or we can focus on the crops and that focuses on imparting plant tolerance and enhancing growth in spite of salt presence. And the two main categories of remediation strategy, strategy that I wanna talk about today are traditional methods, which focus primarily on drainage, leaching, and switching crops. And then some modern ones that are really not used commercially, but it's, it's in the scientific literature and people are experimenting all the time to try to come up with some more economical and holistic and environmentally friendly ways of managing it. We'll talk about some of those too. So first off, let's talk about some traditional methods in the soil centric way. So the first way that you manage salinity is soil leaching, 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 leaching. I mean, whenever it comes about salt management, just remember drainage, drainage, drainage. We have to have a place for our water and salts to go. So if you have a soil sample and you know that the amount of salt in that soil, and then you also take a sample of your irrigation water and you measure the EC of that, there is an equation, and I'll show you here in the next, next slide, about how to calculate how much to water to try to alleviate the, your salts. They call it a leaching fraction or leaching ratio. So it's basically um, how much extra do I need to water in order to push salts out the bottom of the root zone. And that, that's also kind of the same principle of this next um, method here, which is pre post season flushing. So this is kind of what I was talking about early on in the presentation when I said as deficit irrigation becomes popular, which means let's say I'm in a situation where I don't get my full amount of water in a season because water is scarce this year, we're in a drought or something. Well, we want to make sure that in addition to meeting the water requirements as much as possible in the times where the plants most need it, we want to make sure we save enough water to flush out the salts or at least have a plan for it to maybe do it once every five years or so because um, if you just do deficit irrigation every year and, and, and you're going to leave some more salt into the soil every year because the water won't be able to go beneath the roots, it's going to go into the root zone and then dry up and leave all those salts like we saw earlier. So it's very important to account for pre and post season slush, um, flushing when you have a deficit irrigation situation. Um, sometimes you can use emergency tillage um, or just you know some deep root uh, canals for and drainage. So, uh, and just basic tillage too. So uh, if you have a surface irrigation, for example, where we you know use gated pipe or siphon tubes or something to throw water out onto a field physically on the surface, we want to make sure that that to have proper drainage, we level the field appropriately to maintain a good slope so that water just flows on, it flows off, and there it goes. So that's crucial. If you have ponding, you're just asking for trouble. Um, drainage ditches, they, they also need to be um, sloped properly so that they don't just sit there and pond, pond water at the ends of your field and cause this subsurface leaching into your roots, it's not good. Um, drainage tile. So this is often not a economical option unless we're in some serious, like, uh, for example, let's see, in Colorado, there was an act in around 1918 called the Colorado Drainage Act, where the state of Colorado said we have too many waterlogged places. And by waterlogged, I mean that the water table is very high. And the reason that the water table was high is because, like I said, in Colorado, a lot of ways that we irrigate involve diverting water from a river and putting it back. Well, when you have 
so many canals seeping water all the all the time into your into your water table beneath the the soil the water table rises up into these crop root zones and you have a drainage problem again so the drainage act basically gave people a lot of funding to go out there and install some pvc or ceramic pipes with holes in it that essentially get the water into this pipe and then it's sloped and drains it out the root zone which keeps everything dry so you can see this figure here that's kind of what that looks like you know the pipes are installed the water table um, goes up to the pipes and you have a little bit of a bubble in between but essentially you're getting you're making sure that the water table doesn't come up too high and and also if you use a lot of water on the top and make sure that it has a really good place for it to leave as well because you can cause your own problems if you water in excess and then finally, chemical amendments, right? So if we had a sodic soil with sodium chloride, remember, and how it disperses soil, one of the, the, the ways to fix that is to actually apply another salt, gypsum, to fix it. Because gypsum, because it's a two plus charge with that calcium, remember, it's actually a stronger attraction to soil than sodium with only its one plus charge. So if we apply gypsum and integrate it into the soil that's sodic, the gypsum and the calcium will replace the sodium and freeing it up to be leached, if that makes sense. We can answer questions about that, but then the gypsum replaces it and actually improves the soil structure. And then you can actually begin your leaching regimen to make sure that you get everything out of the soil and get it healthy again. Here's that leaching calculation example. I'm not gonna go into that super in depth, um, but just remember that the leaching ratio is a function of the water EC in your irrigation and it's also a function of your soil EC. And so, for example, if we measured one decisemen per meter in our water electrical conductivity and two decisemens in our soil root zone, and then we knew from the weather station or some other source that we were gonna use one inch of water that day because the plants need one inch of ET, we would plug it in this equation here and we would learn that our leaching ratio is 11.1% or 0.111. And so then you just take your ET or inch of the day and divide it by one minus the leaching ratio. And so what we really need to apply that day is 1.13 inches of water. And, and that will make sure that we apply enough water that the salts get to leach beneath the root zone and then it won't be a problem. So you can either do this at every irrigation, but more likely you're probably gonna do it on every few irrigations because you don't wanna take a soil sample and figure out if you're leaching or not every single irrigation. So it, this is where that pre and post season flushing can be very helpful. And then finally here on the traditional method, switching to a more tolerant crop. So this is, um, and then afforestation a little bit. So if I, we had that corn and I showed you that picture, if I was that farmer, instead of trying to remediate, because that's gonna take a lot of years to do it, I could start a remediation strategy and then try to improve drainage. But in the meantime, I'd probably also plant something like wheat or barley to make sure that I, I'm not just wasting money at that point. So it's an economic decision. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but you can switch to something that's a little more tolerant and try to recoup some of that yield loss that way. And then finally, afforestation, that's what this, this picture illustrates here. So one of the things you can do to improve soil is we're learning in the soil science and the plant science realm that if you plant, you know, uh, if you forest an area, you are actually encouraging soil remediation. Let's say we have a really salty area here, like in this first year where there's that lime on the surface that I talked about. They planted some trees, they planted some weeds, they planted some really um, aggressive plants that, that are basically noxious. But by doing so, those plants started to heal the soil because they emit root exudates and start, you know, the things that their roots actually start healing the soil and cultivating that healthy bacteria and get that soil health back on track. And so after three years, this is what it looked like. And then after eighth year, it mean you couldn't even tell. So um, the, the afforestation is a key part to, to improving soil health and remediating an, remediating an area if you're not planning on using it for, um, you know, crop purposes and, and yield purposes. So now some modern methods. I'm sorry I don't have as cool of pictures about this, but I do want to talk about them a lot because um, they focus tend to be on like holistic, like whole environment systems and really current technologies. So soil centric, um, 
focusing on the soil types of healing here, we have the first one is earthworm and vermicompost. So earthworms, um, there's certain species that survive well in saline soils that can produce, you know, cast and improve the soil water infiltration. So first off, vermicompost or, or the worm cast is, is healthy for soil because earthworms eat the soil, they take the nutrients, they, in, they invigorate it. And that's good, but every time that they move, they're also creating these pathways, right? Um, earthworms are crucial for water infiltration because they make these macro tubes or, or pathways for water to go down. And so integrating earthworms in there, there's been some occasions with limited success of applying earthworms to soil to help with soil problems and, or saline problems. Um, some earthworms do not survive well in, in soil or um, saline soils though. So you need to figure out what kind of species are, are available to you that would tolerate that? Because um, if you apply just like, you know, fishing bait earthworms, I think they're gonna die because the, the salts would just dry them out. It's like putting salt on a, on a snail it, it, or similarly, not quite as dramatic, but it's similar to that effect because earthworms need to be moist. So biochar, this is a hot topic right now. You know, biochar is essentially just an organic product that's been heated in an anaerobic environment um, or a very specific environment to very specific temperatures, but essentially it's like super soil, right? It's, it, it improves, it's got a really high cation exchange capacity. It's got good pH. Uh, typically the EC is, is not a problem on it because it's just like charcoal. Um, the water holding capacity is good on it because there's tons of pores, things like that. It's got, thought, it's pretty much all organic carbon. So it's, it's a great way to investigate um, healing your soil and helping it. And there's been evidence to show that applying biochar can begin to help with salt problems because the biochar will take some of the salts and latch onto it with its cation exchange capacity. So like we saw merging, making the clods and stuff, so it'll absorb it. But then also it improves soil structure. So remember, once again, it's all about drainage. So if biochar is improving the aggregation, creating pathways, you're in a good spot. And then compost amendments. So this one, it comes with a big, oops, it comes with a big asterisk, right? Compost is only as good as the things that you make the compost out of. And I gave a compost lecture about a year ago to some landscapers. And, you know, it's really easy to say that, yeah, compost is just great because it's full of nutrients and it's like, it's going to turn into soil eventually. But what if that's made out of like, all salty materials. Like for example, if it's made out of manure, manure is really salty because manure is concentrated things, right? The animals eat, they concentrate the nutrients and whatever comes out is super concentrated. So if you have manure um, compost amendments, they're typically gonna be salty in themselves. So you need to be very careful about that. Whereas if you made it out of like coffee grounds or something, I believe that that's not so salty, but it has a lower pH. So, you know, it just take compost with an asterisk. And, and my, I guess my recommendation there is if you're gonna consider using a compost amendment, make sure that you're uh, aware of what that compost origin was, you know, see, because usually um, producers of compost will have like a, it's really just a soil test and, and they'll show you what the properties of that compost are. Be careful, read that, try to understand it, ask them as well. Um, they'll usually recommend something for you, but be aware of what your compost is made of, but it works a lot of the same way as biochar. You're improving the organic matter, the soil health, the aggregation, things like that. So electroremediation, this one's a really cool one and it's definitely not used commercially because it, it's still under high amounts of research, but because salts are ions, both positive and negative, we can stick electrodes into the ground or into a body of water, for example, and if we put a, a cathode and an, ana, and an anode in a soil, which means one's a negative charge, one's a positive charge, it's kind of like that electrolysis, electrolysis experiment that you did in chemistry class in junior high too, where you put the, the wires in the water and you get to see the water start bubbling and the, and the hydrogen separates from oxygen. This is similar in that you're shocking the soil and it's causing these salts to separate and it's no longer gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. The, the, calcite, the calcium goes one way towards the negative and then the sulfate goes towards the positive. And, it's, and essentially it's, it's, um, it's concentrating the salts to a localized area. And then you can either remove that concentrated um, soil or you can just keep it as a localized place away from other stuff. But 
this, like I said, this is not used commercially because right now with the stage of research that it's at, it's pretty much limited in the soil environment. It, it's really, it takes a long time for salt to move like that. And it's also really hard to get enough power to make an impact over a large area. I mean, I'm talking like if you, right now they're just doing experiments in between like three feet of distance and it takes a long time and then what, right? It, it's, um, it works, but it's just so slowly. So I can give you more material on that if you're interested. So now the modern methods using crop centric approaches. So AMF, PG, PR inoculation. So fancy way of saying we're introducing fungi and rhizobacteria into the soil. So if we inoculate, which is not that unpopular at all. I mean, a lot of things inoculate in commercial crops, um, mycorrhizal fungi and plant growth promoting bacteria. This is a crop centric approach in that uh, there's been evidence to show that if you promote plant growth in the roots, that it will have a better tolerance for the effects of salinity and that either maybe A, it can grow more roots and, and it can go find water elsewhere away from like a salt, salty place and, and just be better in that area, or it can actually be more tolerant of the salt that's there. And so roots can, can concentrate their own salts and they're in the roots, making a more of an osmotic balance there, and it can try to maintain its, its suction. Um, but just in general, when you apply AMF and rhizobacteria, you're promoting root formation, which is like a very key part of crop tolerance for salinity. All right, seed priming. This is a very new one that I learned about for this presentation, but seed priming is where you take a seed and you wet it, and then you dry it again, but you're kind of starting the germination process a little bit, but it doesn't, the, you know, the, the cotyledon or the, the, the plant itself isn't grown enough that it breaks out of the seed yet, but you kind of pre-grow it and let it stay inside the seed. And then once you actually plant it and you do it, you've, you've primed your seed, right? You've, you've created some growth inside the seed already that primes it for more stressful conditions. And this one's actually kind of promising because it's been shown that that by priming your seed, you are making it well more um, capable of handling environmental stresses like salinity at an early growth stage, which is the most sensitive part for, for most plants, generally speaking. So when it's young, it's the most susceptible to salt damage, but priming is helping a lot. So obviously the cost of that is you have to you have to go through all the effort of seed priming, which is is not really commercial yet. I mean, this is just um, some horticultural research at the moment, so it's kind of costly. And you can imagine what that would be. It might not be worth it on a cheap crop, relatively like corn or barley, but maybe it would be worth it someday on something like cantaloupe or peppers or something like a high value crop. And then crop selection. So this sounds like the traditional method, but um, what I'm speaking about here when it comes to salt or crop selection is there's kind of ways to use cover crops to concentrate or remove salts from a field. So for example, if I put here like plant some salt grass, the salt grass will actually absorb some of the salts into the plant itself. And then if you remove those plants full of salt, you're removing salt from the system. However, this has only been met with limited success as well because the amount of salt that these plants can uptake is usually not enough to make a long-term impact. But I mean, it is, it is helpful. Every little bit helps, right? So the, the modern methods are not about solving the issue with one miracle problem, but rather looking at it holistically. So maybe you, you do all of these things. You seed prime, you in, inoculate, you do some cover cropping in the off season to remove some salts. And then also finally here, genetic engineering. I mean, this one's this one's kind of an obvious one for the people in the plant science realm. Um, people are trying all the time right now to find drought tolerant and salt tolerant genes to, to turn on, per se, in, the, in a genome of, of, of given crops. I mean, if we can turn on something that, that lets corn concentrate those, those salts in the root zone to make it a little more acceptable to salts there and things like that, that's something we're really looking forward to. Um, you know, a lot of the genetic engineering and the DNA modification for that is, is it, and it's really not genetic engineering. It's both hybridization, so traditional crop breeding. I'd say that's the majority, but there is some genetic engineering to try to speed that process along. There hasn't been any research to my knowledge where they're trying to do something where they take a species of something else and put it into a crop like corn 
to make it more salt tolerant. That hasn't been explored. And, and there, that's because there's not a lot of other organisms that just um, accept salt in a way that, that would be genetically advantageous for corn. So anyway, and other plants. Um, so genetic engineering, we can talk more about that in the questions if you'd like, I can, I can speak about that a little more. But I, I thought I'd, I'd share this. So this is from a, a recent paper I just reviewed um, or, or I just read, and it's a review paper about the method. So the, I kind of borrowed their, their methods of separating it, but this summarizes not only how the, the, the plants get affected, but also these kinds of management strategies. So once again, this is a reference material. I can get any of you the paper that you're interested. And um, now I'd like to summarize up all of my presentations with a practical takeaway. So- EJ? Yes. We actually have a question here in the chat box. Oh, great, let's, let's do it. In many river deltas, there is salt intrusion from the ocean and the soil salt, soils are salt affected. In addition, the water table is usually quite high one to four feet throughout the year and the drainage system does not work always. What might be the best solution for small farmers? Very good. Yeah, I think um, that's that's kind of the, you hit the nail on the head. Thanks for that question. Um, that's a situation that that my research is focused in too. It's not, it's not ocean intrusion, but similarly with a shallow water table, when you can't leach it, what do you do? You're kind of limited in your options. Um, if there's not a drainage tile, situation installed, you could install one. But once again, that's very costly. And if I was in that situation myself, I would probably look at just looking at a more tolerant crop. Um, because there's not a whole lot you can do about ocean intrusion. You cannot do a whole lot if you have a shallow water table and can't afford or it's not practical to install drainage tiles. So this is where you would probably look at switching crops and then trying to maintain your soil health as much as possible. Um, if there are methods of getting the water out, I mean, that's, uh, there have been actually some research, especially in California, to look at applying desalinized water. Um, once again, this is very not economical at the scale that it is right now, but if you can get some pure water, you can do some uh, pure water application with a leaching fraction, and that would be able to sustain crop growth pretty well. Uh, but it's not really solving the long-term issue. You're still having a shallow water table, but if you can get that pure water, um, that's really where you're gonna be help, most helpful. So I'd say I'd switch to a crop or try to find some cleaner, a cleaner water source and use a leaching fraction myself. Which is kind of what this slide is about. So um, practical takeaways, irrigate with good quality water and leach excess salts with, with leaching ratio calculations. So if no good quality water is available, leach as realistically as possible. And if there's a water shortage for leaching, consider switching to a more tolerant crop. You know, uh, sometimes you just gotta cut your losses and just say, look, it's not practical to grow strawberries here because it's way too salty and, it's, and our hydrological system is just not gonna be good for that. So it's probably better to just switch crops at that point. Um, sodic soils may require gypsum. So remember that, be, be, be careful to understand what kind of salts are in your soil because that's the key to remediation and things if you, can, if you need to apply um, chemical amendments to, to help fix the issue. And then if you were to apply gypsum, you apply the gypsum, you integrate it with tillage and then you can leach, but you need to make sure that gypsum gets in there and gets in, in with the soil and um, has a chance to replace the sodium ions in the soil. And then finally, if the budget is available and it is economical, install some tile drains to encourage that drainage because that's, that's a very common in the Midwest and especially in like the Corn Belt. There's so much water out there just from rain that they're trying to get water away all the time. So that seems to be more economical there than it is say in the, in the, very, in the arid West, like in Colorado, it's pretty rare to see it. So that's kind of my practical takeaways. And then I guess the first one, modern solutions, although really innovative and seem to be, have a lot of promise, they're just not pragmatic yet. They're not practical and because the small economic scale that they're at. So in most cases, traditional methods would suffice. And so that's, I've reached the end here and I'd like to open it up for questions. I'd like to acknowledge my PhD research project, some of my colleagues here, my committee um, and some of my funding, but really just thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions both here on the call, 
but also my email address is here and you can find me there and I'm hoping Nicole can also provide you any of my contact information that you need. So thank you again. Thanks, AJ. Do we have any questions? Feel free to write them in the chat or uh, ask verbally if you'd like. In addition, um, AJ's contact information is here on this slide, but it is also in the Dropbox folder with his bio that I sent out to you guys yesterday, um, or actually the day before. So um, you should have access to that as well. <clears throat> Any questions? All right, it looks like there is no questions. Um, well, again, thank you, AJ, for doing this great presentation on soil salinity. And thank you all for joining in on this session. Our next session, Greenhouse and Nursery Irrigation, will begin at you are tuning in for that, 2 p.m. Eastern. As a reminder, each session has their own unique Zoom link. So with that, thank you again, AJ, and a big thank you to our sponsor, Rainbird. And I will see those of you that are signed up for the next session at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you guys. Oh, actually, before we wrap up, I did just see another question come through. Is gypsum application effective in soils with high um, CA, CO3 content soils? Yeah, I just saw that myself, Nicole. So. Um... Yes, it, 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 well, gypsum is actually, uh, let me rephrase that. I don't wanna say yes, because that's what you should do, no. Gypsum is not helpful for calcite soils because calcite itself is already a calcium-based salt. Um, but I would also say that rarely is calcium carbonate or CaCO3 an issue. It's, it's rarely in such a presence that it's, it's a salinity issue. Calcium carbonate is actually more of a mineral issue. And, it, it, and when it's so, when, it, when there's so much of it that it's causing plant problems, it's, it's usually from toxicity or uh, like it's, it's crystallized so much that it's just like rocks in your soil. The, the EC effects of calcium carbonate are almost negligible. So it's not really having that same kind of effect of gypsum or sodium on the water. It's not like drinking calcium carbonate because calcium, or, or calcium carbonate just doesn't dissolve in water very well. So I, I would say if you have a calcium carbonate problem, it's not going to be the same kind of salinity problem where it's like drinking ocean water. It's going to be because it's so present that you have like rocks in your soil or it's literally there's like no nutrients at all because it's just like calcite powder. So that's a little different. I would say that that's probably where you need to look at um, if, there, if, if that soil is even good enough for planting. But I'd be happy to talk more in depth about that if you email me, if there's a specific application that you're thinking of. But to answer your question again, gypsum is not an effective way to remediate calcium carbonate issues. Thanks, AJ. Any additional questions? Okay, well, again, thank you, AJ, and thank you all for tuning in. The next session, which is nursery and greenhouse irrigation, will begin at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Bye-bye.